Father in heaven, how we love you. We lift your name in all the earth. May your kingdom be established in our praises. And as your people, we declare your mighty works. Blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And blessed be the Lord God Almighty, who reigns forevermore. Our Father, we we'll thank you for yet another opportunity to sit at your feet today, to learn, Father, to hear the words that are coming from your heart. Lord, we we'll pray today that, Lord, you would impact our lives in the name of Jesus. We we'll pray today that our lives would not be the same by the reason, Father, of your transforming word. Let your word transform us today in the name of Jesus. Lord, we bless you. We glorify your name. For in Jesus' precious name, we have prayed. Brethren, I greet us once again today in the name of our precious Lord Jesus. It's another uh, City Impact Bible study. Uh, trust we have been keeping safe and trust that God has been faithful to us. God is faithful. The Bible says his faithfulness, they are new every morning. And, 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 and his goodness towards us, they are unending. And so today we just want to um, share the word of God with us today. And I want us to open our hearts today, even as we learn from the Lord. Ordinarily speaking today, I, I wouldn't have just put any title to this. It would have just been a pure exaltation for the brethren. But for the sake of um, title, I'll call these men that establish the kingdom. Men that establish the kingdom. When you read the scriptures, starting from Jesus, down to the apostles and even the disciples after them in the book of Acts, you will see that there is a manner of men that those set of people were that enabled them to walk with God and enabled God to walk through them in such a manner that the things that were in the heart of God, they were all fulfilled. And now today, I look critically at the Bible and I look at the instances and look at the lives of this man. And one of the things I try to do is to take my life and take this present church. And now when I say church, I'm not talking about CGCC alone. I'm talking about the church, the church universal and take this same church and put it side by side, the life of the men that we saw in the scriptures and the life of the church of old. I compare it and I see that indeed there is gap. And this gap that I see, I wonder whether or not it does not disturb the church or it does not disturb brethren again. Because for me, it's a big matter because if the standard of God remains sure, if the foundation remains sure, God is not going to lower anything for us. It means that the same standard with which God upheld the brethren then is the same standard that God is looking to uphold us today. And, you know, the question that readily comes to mind is exactly why um, are you saved? Why are we saved? Now, because you will find out that somehow, somewhere, in the mix of, it, of, of everything, we all of a sudden are forgetting that there is a reason for your salvation and for my salvation. And if care is not taken, I and you will go about life 
in a vicious circle and continue and all of a sudden, boom, we are no more here on this side of eternity. Life has happened to us and we have not been able to do anything with heaven's investment in our lives. Friends, church, listen to me. I want you to understand that the vision of the church and the purpose of the church is not different from the vision and the purpose of Jesus because the church is an extension of Jesus Christ. And so the church cannot have a vision, a purpose that is contrary to the vision and to the purpose of Christ. And the same thing applies to the individual members in particular that makes up the church. The vision of a believer, the vision of a saint cannot be contrary to the vision of Christ and to the purpose of Christ. It must be the same because your life is an extension of his life. John chapter number, chapter number 17, 18. It reads, as you sent me into the world, I also sent them into the world. We are an extension of him. The same way that God sent him, the mandates that heaven gave to him is the same mandates that God has given to us. Give me John 20, 21. It says, so Jesus said to them again, peace to you as the father has sent me, I also send you. You're not running your own race. You're not running your own vision, your own purpose outside of the vision and outside of the purpose of heaven. Now, because one of the things I've come to discover and I'm seeing in life is that all of a sudden men have mastered the act of using God as a means to their end of using Christ as a means to their end. Hear me and hear me very well, brothers and sisters. You cannot use Christ as a means to your end. Rather, God is supposed to use you to use me as a means to his end, just the same way Christ submitted himself to be the means to God's end. <laughs> And so if you look critically and fundamentally at the life of Jesus Christ, you will find out that he tells us clearly that the reason why he's here, the reason why you're here is well articulated in Matthew chapter number 6, 9 and 10. He said in this manner pray, the disciples came to him and they asked him to teach them to pray. And he said in this manner pray. And he said... Therefore, pray our Father in heaven, hallowed will be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Brothers and sisters, that is the reason for your salvation. That is the reason for your life. That is the reason for my life. Now, that everything that a man is doing and everything a man is accomplishing and becoming, if at the end of the day, what you're becoming and what you're doing is not extending the frontiers of the kingdom, the day you will see your Lord and your maker, you will find that, that in deed and in truth, your life has not actually been of value to him. Your life has been wasted on you and not on him. There is a manner of life that we see in the scriptures. And that manner of life is the life that God is looking for. There is a standard in God's mind for every man. That standard is the standard that can dislodge darkness and establish the kingdom of God. God knows the standard and darkness also knows the standard. And that, that standard is the man Christ. That standard is the man Christ. And that is why the desire of heaven is that Christ will be formed in you. 
And that is why if you read the writings of Apostle Paul, Apostle Paul will always tell you that I desire to know nothing else. I desire to be acquainted with nothing else except Christ and him crucified. Because Paul understands that if a man does not rise up to the stature of Christ, that man cannot that man cannot fulfill the purpose of heaven. Because you see, there is a stature that fulfills the purpose of heaven. And it's when man has risen and has become in the likeness of Christ. Brothers and sisters, I am saying this because if you do not understand it, if I do not understand it, you will think for a moment, that life is about accomplishing one success or the other in whatever endeavor you find your hands doing. As beautiful as that may seem, if you do not know it, you'll be carried away by the things that are happening around you. You'll be carried away by the desire to marry and get married. You'll be carried away by the desire to own and acquire. You'll be carried away by everything that carries men away. And at the end of the day, you would not for any reason grow into who you're supposed to be to fulfill the purpose of heaven for your life. It is Christ in you that adds value to heaven because it is Christ in you that can bring about the fulfillment of everything that God desires. <clears throat> Give me the book of Romans chapter 8, 29. Let's just read the scripture. For whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn amongst many brethren. You see, the Bible tells us here clearly that God's desire is that you will come to the place of conformity. Now, when you come to the place of conformity, principalities and powers that will see you, they will understand that they can't come close because you have conformed to what God wants. See, friends, I want us to understand that we need to morph in life. In life, a man cannot be static in life. The man must grow to become what God desires him to be. That is the story of the butterfly. I was sharing this with the youths on, on Saturday. The butterfly comes as an egg, but the butterfly does not remain as an egg. The butterfly will morph from bringing an egg. At a point, it will become a larva. It will become a caterpillar. And before you know it, it will become the full butterfly because in the egg stage, you can't fulfill anything. A lot of us will get into the faith, will get born again, and that is where we remain all the days of our Christian life. And meanwhile, that man that you are in that state cannot accomplish anything for heaven, for, for heaven. You must grow. I must grow. You must. The Bible said Jesus himself. Let's read the scriptures. In Luke chapter number 2, verse 40. And the child grew. And became strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. That's Jesus. Jesus did not remain a child. You can't afford to remain a child in the faith. Jesus grew from being a child. He grew in spirit. He grew in wisdom. And therefore, he could engage everything that God wanted him to engage. Give me the book of Peter. Let's read the book of Peter. Peter was writing to the church. Second Peter, from verse 1, I'll read from 5. He says, but also for you, for this very reason, giving all diligence, add to your faith virtue. That you have faith, that you have come into the faith does not mean you will stop there. Add to your faith virtue and to your virtue, add knowledge. To your knowledge, add self-control. And to self-control, add perseverance. And to perseverance, godliness. And to godliness, brotherly kindness. And to brotherly kindness, love. 
For if these things are yours and abound, you would neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen to me, brothers and sisters. A man, a woman can be barren in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You can live all your Christian, entire Christian life, and your life is barren, producing nothing. Why? Because you did not morph, change from one level to another level. You refuse to morph. You refuse to just grow like Jesus did. If you read the Bible, give me 2 Peter 3, verse 18. Here, Peter was admonishing the church. He said, but grow in grace. Grace is not static, friends. Grow in grace. Grow in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ and our Savior. You need to grow because if you do not grow, you can't engage darkness. With your present level of spirituality, you can't engage darkness. With your present level of spirituality, all the realities of faith you cannot accomplish. And we think, you know, let's draw from the physical and let's come to the spiritual because the Bible tells us that from the things that you see in the physical, you are able to know the things that are even spiritual. You see men invest time in business. You see them invest time on their bodies. You see them go to gym. And when you see them, you see they are well built. They invest time in their mind, reading books upon books. And when you engage them mentally, you can't stand them. But you see, one area that we do not do any investment is in the investment of our spirit man. And you think that you can be strong in the spirit if you do not invest in the spirit. Forget it, perish it. It is what you put in that you will get out. The Bible said, do not, be do not be deceived, for God cannot be mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, the man will reap. If the man sows to the spirit, he will reap of the spirit. But if the man sows to his flesh, of the flesh, the man also will reap. There is investment in this kingdom. We need to move. We need to morph. Your current level of spirituality cannot achieve anything for heaven. If you read Mark chapter number 16, it tells us clearly, these signs shall follow them that believe. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out demons. They will speak in, in new tongue. They will take off serpents. And if they drink anything deadly, it will not it will by no means hurt them. They will lay their hands on the sick and they will recover. Now, if you read the scriptures, you need to ask yourself, these signs that the Bible talked about, are these signs following me? How can we be comfortable? Like I said, ordinarily for me, it's just for us to, it's a word of exaltation for us. How can you and I be comfortable in this state? That you look at the scriptures and you see the things that the Bible has said that these things are consigning you and this is the level you're supposed to operate and you're looking at yourself, you're not operating in those levels and you're comfortable. And I'm comfortable. And we come to church on Sunday and we just enjoy ourselves and we clap our hands and we leave the church premises and we think that's what the, the faith is about. No, that's not what the faith is about. Let me tell us, brothers and sisters, and, and I'll tell you why it seems as though this thing is aching in my heart. Never in the history of creation has the church been as populated as it is today. Never. In the history of of creation in the church history. And also never in the history of the church has the church been as prosperous as the church is today. Gone were those days when you would say as poor as church rat. Gone are those days. Why? Because there is substance in the church today. But again, never in church history has the church been as weak, as powerless as it is today. 
Peter looked at that man. He says, silver or gold, have I not? But what I have in the name of the Lord Jesus, we give to you. He touched the line. The man stood up. Today we have silver, we have gold, but we do not have the power of the Almighty. Why? Because men do not understand that as you enter the faith, it's not the way God expects you to remain. He expects me that the man that I was yesterday is not the man that I am today. That the man that I am today would not be the man that I'll be tomorrow. Because I'm adding to my faith, I am adding virtue. To my virtue, I'm adding knowledge. To my knowledge, I am adding self-control. To my self-control, I'm adding perseverance. To my perseverance, I'm adding godliness. To my godliness, I'm adding kindness. And to kindness, I'm adding love. I am adding every day. I'm accentuating. I'm increasing. We come into the faith, you see the Bible, the practice of the faith, and you're not practicing as it is written. And a lot of times the Holy Spirit, friends, I am, I, I am going to tell us just plain truths. You know, let's just have plain truths and just tell ourselves plain truth. Hear me and hear me very well. There is something that is called... Potential, energy, latent energy, and there's something that is called kinetic energy. <laughs> now, that you have a potential to accomplish something does not mean you accomplish that thing. So potential energy just tells you what you are able to accomplish. In like manner, a couple of the things that we see in the scriptures, there are things that point to you, your potentials as a believer. Now, your latent energy is when you see those scriptures that tells you who you are, tells you that the Holy Spirit is in you, tells you that you can lay your hands on the sick and the sick will recover, is telling you that there is a latent capacity in you, that the capacity is already in you. But you see, for that latent capacity that is in you to become potential, to, to become kinetic, you must put it to work. So that it will not just be the potential of the faith, but it will become indeed and a reality in your life and in my life. And so the lives of these men that established the kingdom, they were men that continually were changing from one degree to another. Changing. The man that you saw yesterday, you, you see him today. The man has increased in Christ. Because Christ has, has, has taken room in that man. Friends, you know, one of the things you find out in the, in the scriptures, the Bible tells us about Elijah. Elijah came to a particular place after he was, he was running. And he lay down there and the, Elijah was sleeping. And an angel came to tap Elijah and he said, Elijah, rise up and eat for the journey is far. Friends, you know, a lot of times God has seen the distance that you need to travel. God knows the distance that I need to travel. And so a lot of times by his spirit, he will come to awaken you. By his spirit, he will come to tap you, to tell you, rise up. Rise up. There is a walk. This is not who you are. This is not where, this is not the person that I create. This is not how I created your life to end. Open yourself to me. Give yourself to me. Throw away this laziness. Throw away this apathy to things that are spiritual. Some of us are absolutely spiritually lazy. And if you get to understand the fact that it is the spiritual that controls the physical, then you now understand the reason why you cannot afford to be spiritually immature or be spiritually lazy. You can't afford to be. I can't afford to be. And I tell you the truth. One of the things that I, I tell God is, Lord, Lord, you know something? I'm going to go with you on this walk. Lord, I am not going to stop at anything. 
And Lord, do not leave me alone. Lord, just help me. But you know what? Father, I will continue to extend myself. I will continue to extend myself. I will extend myself in prayers. I will extend myself in study. I will extend myself in practice. I will give myself to whatsoever thing you have spoken, whatsoever thing you have said. I will extend myself because, Father, I know that you did not just create me to just say I am born again. That would not be of any value to you. We read the parable of the talent, like the ID was reading to us last week. You think that the, the grace of God that is given to you, you think it's not a talent that God has given? Or you think the Holy Spirit that, domic that is domiciled in you, you think the Holy Spirit is not a talent that God has given to you? And you think tomorrow heaven would not ask me, heaven would not ask you that what did you do with the grace that I poured upon you? What did you do with the spirit that was domiciled in you? What did you do with your faith? Men are around you, you can't save them. Women are around you, you can't save them. Your family, you can't save. And things are happening. Darkness is invading the earth. And you are there with the grace of God. You can't do anything. And you're saying that you're in the faith. Because you refuse to morph. Because you refuse to give room to the Almighty. So that the Almighty will grow in you. And fulfill his purpose through you. Listen, let's read the scriptures. You know, the Bible tells us about, a par about certain men. In Matthew chapter number 7, <laughs> 7, 13, and 14. Now, this is the reason why I am crying out today. I'm crying out today, and, and this is the reason why I'm crying out. Enter by the narrow gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction. And there are many who go by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to life. And there are few who find it. The way that leads to life is narrow. Okay, and very few people find it. Brothers and sisters, I said to myself, I would not be a foolish virgin. I read that story again. I would not be a foolish virgin walking the face of the earth, but there is no oil in your lamp. And all of a sudden, boom, the Savior comes. And then you look, there's no oil in your lamp. And that is it, you have missed it. Because you're not taking time to look at yourself and say, hey, is there oil in this lamp? The Bible said in the book of Revelation, Jesus said, I wish you are either hot or cold. Now, because you're not hot and you're not cold, I am going to spill you out of my mouth. Why? Because men are not calibrating. Men are not looking at their lives. Men are not asking questions. Is my life producing as it ought to produce? And therefore, they do not need anybody to speak to them. They do a self-introspection. And every day they come to the Almighty and are saying, Father, help. Their voice is going to heaven. They are crying to heaven every day. They look at themselves and they know. They look at the scriptures. They look at Christ. They look at men that their lives are written for them to learn in the scriptures and they look at their life, they say, no, no, Lord, this is not it. I can see this is not it. Father, this way that I am is not it. And Lord, you need to help me. And God says, because you have asked, I will help. God will extend help. And you see that man, you see that woman changing. Or else you can choose to be the man you can choose to be the woman that is satisfied with what you're seeing. You're satisfied because your bank account is growing. You're satisfied because you're living the large life. You're satisfied because, you know, you, you're, you're living in luxury. You're living in splendor. You're satisfied. One day you'll find out that it's not enough. Romans chapter number 12. And Jesus begins to tell us here through Paul, I beseech you. Paul was begging. I beseech you, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, 
holy, acceptable to God. Hebrews. Now, why I'm reading the scriptures is I'm trying to tell us the kind of men that established the kingdom. These men have sat their lives. These men just know that, Lord, I am here and I am here for you. And so they understand that everything that the Lord and the master has put into their hands is for him. It's for him. Hear what Jesus said. Therefore, when I came into the world, he said, sacrifice and offering you did not desire. God has never, God never. Brothers, listen to me and listen to me very well. Perhaps you're that one that the satisfaction that you have is that you pay your tithe and you pay your offering. And that perhaps you belong to a department and that is all. No, no, that is not enough. It's a sacrifice. You, you understand? Sacrifice and offerings. You did not desire. That's not the desire of heaven. Because you know somewhere he said, look, if I was hungry, I would not ask you because the cattle, the thousand, the cattle in the thousand hills, they are his. The gold is mine, the silver is mine. So there is nothing that indeed that you're giving to me that I do not have. Let me continue to read Hebrews. It says, sacrifice and offerings you did not desire, but a body you have prepared for me. In bond offerings and in sacrifices for sin, you had no pleasure. Then I said, Lo, behold, I have come in the volume of the book. It is written of me to do your will, O God. That is the life of men that establish the kingdom. I know that it's not the peace meal that I give to God. It's not that thing that I bring and I say I've, I've given. That. That's not what God wants from me. If your life is going to establish the kingdom, if my life is going to establish the kingdom, like we see the life of the likes of Paul and the rest of them, then we must understand that a body has it prepared for you. And lo, you have come here not to do any other thing, but to do the will of the one that created. The days are coming. When bam, the bridegroom has come, and the wise virgins, they have oil in their lamps. But the foolish virgins are walking the face of the earth, all in the name, I'm born again, I'm in church. There is no oil in the lamp. Lord, you would help me. I would not make that kind of mistake. Help us, oh God. One of the things that pastor does is and that's why it's called moment of truth pastor never will stop telling the church would never stop telling the world the truth and that is what i'm doing today i would not stop telling the truth like my pastor because i know a day will come god will ask me did you tell them Did you tell them that wasting them, themselves on themselves is not going to be something that will stand the day they will stand before me? Now, Colossians. Give me Colossians 1. 29 and 28, 29. Now, I want us to see the lives of this man because their lives are like open book for us to see. Now, this is what Paul said in Colossians chapter number 1, 28 and 29. He said, him will preach, and him is Jesus, warning every man and teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ. To this end, I also labor, striving according to his walking, which works in me mightily. The desire of Paul, to present every man perfect in Christ. And he said, to that end, he labors. Jesus said, don't you know I will be about my father's business? Hear me. 
Hear me very well today. Any business that you're embarking on that is not the father's business is not a business you should find yourself doing. Because the father's business does not necessarily mean that you're preaching. No, the father's business means that every platform that you find yourself is the father's business. Are you a doctor? You're about your father's business. Are you a nurse? You're about your father's business. Are you a construction worker? You are about your father's business. Any business that you find yourself doing and that business is not your father's business, you don't have any business there. Because that's the reason why you're here. Because in that sphere where God has put you, God expects you to present all men perfect before him. And that already means that there's a responsibility on your own part because you cannot give what you do not have. What manner of men are these men that establish the kingdom? 1 Corinthians 4 verse 1. Let me read. Let a man so consider us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Servants of Christ, stewards of the mystery of Christ. It never leaves their psyche. For one moment, they do not forget why they are here. For one moment, you must not forget why you're here. Never forget, brothers and sisters, do not let life so happen to you that all of a sudden you just think like the unbeliever that is here that life is just what it is. And so let's just live life. No. They are servants and they are stewards of the mysteries of Christ. Remember, the Bible tells us something. It said, that to them I speak in parable, but to you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom. God gave you to know the mysteries of the kingdom. Why? So that you be a servant and a steward of that mystery. That by your life, that men will come to the place of knowledge of the mystery of God. Men that establish the kingdom. <clears throat> I want to read 1 John 3. 1 John 3, verse number 16. Now, here John writes, And by this we know love, because he laid down his life for us. We also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Give me Acts chapter number 4. 32 to 35. Now, because you see, if we understand these things, we will understand what manner of men we ought to be. Now, the multitude of those who believed were of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things he possessed was his own, but they had all things in common. And with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. Nor was there anyone amongst them who lacked for all who were all who were possessors of lands and houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet. And they distributed to each one as they all had need. Friends, where we read, John said that if Christ died for us, therefore we too ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Now, any man that comes to these points that we're talking about, these men were men that had lost possession of things to the Father. They did not count anything as belonging to them again. The absolutely possession, they had lost the ownership of possession. They said, Lord, everything now belongs to you and belongs to your church. And that is the reason why men will go to the point. I mean, you will know that before I will get to the point of selling 
my property and bringing the money, it means that cash don't finish. So they have given all they have in terms of material and they could go beyond what they have and they went to sell what they have and they laid it down at the feet of the apostles. Why? For the brethren because they have lost possession and ownership of everything they have. And little wonder we are preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and preaching and nothing is happening. We go for evangelism and go for evangelism and nothing is happening. Why? Because the life that was set before us, we don't want to live the life that is set before us. We want to live in accordance to the way we want it. And yet we think we will have the results they had. And that is the reason why I said today, power like never before in the history of the church has disappeared. Impact, like never before in the history of the church has disappeared. In those days, in a city, you can just have only three believers, five believers, but that five believers in that city will hold the city to a standstill because they were believers indeed. One John Knox who holds Scotland because he was a believer indeed. And I wonder how this thing does not even bother us. That's the question I'm asking. How is it that it does not bother you? How is it that it does not give you sleepless night? How? And I will shamelessly come before God in the place of prayer. And all I'm telling God is, Shele, you for me, do this for me. Me namka, me namka, do this for me. And God is looking at me. Is it all about it? And I remain infantile. Listen to me, friends. I want us to understand. If you look at the life of a plant, if you look at the life of a mango, mango does not begin to beg God, Lord, let me bear fruit. Lord, please, let me bear fruit. No. All mango needs to do is to have his roots on the earth. Once that mango has his root on the earth, and every other element is right, once the time for fruit bearing comes, the mango will bear fruit. It doesn't need to pray about it. And your tree is planted. If you're planted in the Lord and your root goes down in him, like Paul will write to us, that our root should go down in him. If your root goes down in the Lord and you remain in him, your life will bear fruit. And so this man, you find them, they have lost possession. And each day I'm asking God, Father, help me. May I not, help me, bring me to the place where nothing else matters. May I not hold anything. Uh -uh. Somebody will say, is I here now? It's one life. After 70 years, what do I have to offer? Even the world will reject you at a particular age. To back page 65, maybe they will give you retirement. That's when you go and preach the gospel at 65. Or when, when you have retired, there's no energy again. And meanwhile, now, in this your youthful age, that where you are, in that sphere that you are. And the thing I'm telling us is, you see, we have made the gospel very complex and difficult. Because it's about God walking through you. It's not about you. And so your own work is to release yourself so that he can walk through you. And so when I come to the place of prayer and I stay with the father and the master, what he does is that I allow him to infuse himself through me. And when I get to the office, what God does is God will begin to arrange situations and circumstances that will glorify himself. And that is why God will enter into the mind of Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar will think on heaven's earth, I will build a God that everybody will come and bow down to. He doesn't know he was set up by God because God has found Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and God wanted to glorify himself in Babylon. And when God finds a man like Joseph in Egypt, God will glorify himself. But you see, when there are no men, fruit bearing will become very difficult. But once you're maturing, once your roots is on the earth, there is no way kingdoms will not bow to our God because God has found men that can bring the nations to their knees. Hey, Joe. 
Lord, help us. Second, First Corinthians 13, 1 to 7. Now, listen to Paul. Now, because you see, these scriptures are there, and we read them, and when we read them, we will gloss over them. We will, we would, it will be like storytelling. But hear what Paul was writing. In 1 Corinthians 13, I'll read from verse 4. Love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself. It's not puffed up. Love does not, have, is, does not behave rudely, does not seek its own. It's not provoked. Thinks no evil. Does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in truth. Bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love. Do you have this level of this kind of love? If you don't have this kind of love in you, when did you come to God last and started to cry, Lord, this is the way my life is supposed to be? When did I come to God and say, Lord, I can see, Lord, that I'm not carrying. Because you see, what you see here is not the kind of love that Adam has. This is the love of Christ. It's called the agape kind of love. And this agape kind of love is a love that can win the world. It's the love that can establish the kingdom of God upon the face of the earth. There is no other love. The Adamic love is selfish. And you, I hear some funny things you, you, you ask, okay? I, it, it sounds wise to us, but some of those things are the wisdom of men. That when you do something for me, that's when I should do that same, do something back for you. You hear that in the relationship of husband and wife. It's when, when, you, when you pour water and wet the ground, then that is when your wife also should respond to you. It's Adamic. Or when your husband has given you money, that's when you respond. That is Adamic. Those things are not of God. That's not the way of the cross. That's not the way of faith. That's not the love of the Bible. He said, love your enemies and do good to those who, who despitefully use you. Not to talk of your wife, not to talk of your husband. And instead of us to look at the level at which we are falling and be crying to God that this is not who I am supposed to be, we'll find ways of justifying it. Second Corinthians 4, 7 to 12. These men, their lives, what their lives transmit and impact is life. They carry life, and what they exude is life. Anywhere they go, this man is life that they are passing. And that is why sometimes if you go and listen, Peter said something. When they looked at this man and they perceived that this man were not learned, uh -uh. the Bible said they looked at Jesus Christ, they knew that this man was not lettered. He didn't go to any school, but yet they couldn't mistake one thing. In the life of Jesus, in the life of the apostles, they carried life. They transmitted life. They spoke life. I mean, as a preacher, I'm not supposed to speak to you, and the only thing I give to you is knowledge. If I give you only knowledge, I've not done anything, because what I'm supposed to give to you is life. You're supposed to carry life when you hear the word of God, because the word of God has the capacity to change you, to change your situation. It has life in itself. Jesus said, I have come that they may have life, and have life more abundantly. In that office, that man that is sick should come to you because he understands that you carry life. That woman will come to you because he understands that you carry life. That couple that is having problem in their marriage, know that your word carries life. There is grace. Your word is seasoned. You don't talk like any other person. As you're speaking, there is the life of the Almighty, the energy of God that is passing through your word, that is resolving situations and circumstances because you are a carrier of life. 
Why? Because you see, before the morning comes, the Bible tells us that Jesus, way, way before the break of dawn, sits with the Father and that God of heavens and the earth is sitting over him. God is brooding over him. God is sitting over his life. And when he comes, the words that are coming from his mouth are words that are crafted by heaven. Let me read 2 Corinthians 4 verse number 7. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God is in earthen vessels, meaning that natural men like you and me, but there is a treasure in us. It says so that the excellency of the power may be of God. There are men and women, vessels that carry the power of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, ah, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, that the life of Jesus also may be made manifest in our body. It's about life. It's about the manifestation of life. Your word comes and it comes with life. Your presence comes. It comes with life. In your family, they know there is a life carrier in my family and you pass through barrier places. Life comes to that place. Why? Because you carry life. You look at the woman whose womb they've said is barren. You are able to hold her because you are the carrier of life and all of a sudden the womb Womb comes alive because you carry life. Why are we playing church? What kind of faith are we practicing? I want you to go to God. I am what I'm telling you. I'm not telling you and I'm not just that. I am telling you because every day in my life I'm crying to God. I am tired of what I'm seeing. I am discontented with what I'm seeing. This is not the church that you left. This is not the mic you want to see. There is another Michael you want to see. That Michael is the Michael I want you to see in my life. And so I'm not going to give God peace. I can't go to my bed and say it is well. All is not well. It is not well. The earlier we start telling ourselves the truth as a church, that is all. All is not well, the better for us. All is not well. All will be only well when God gets what he wants from my life. Second Corinth, First Corinthians. If you read First Corinthians 15, verse number 4, it tells us, First Corinthians 15, 45, as it is written, the first Adam became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. What we transmit is spirit. We don't transmit any other thing other than the spirit of God. We transmit life. Wherever we go, we transmit the life of the Almighty. See, friends, the degree to which a man is able to express life, the degree to which a man is able to carry life is the degree to which the man also has exposed himself to the dealings of the Almighty. In other words, if you want to carry life, you have passed through death. Because you have to pass through death to enter life. So if I want to carry life, I have to submit my, myself to the crushing of the cross so that those things that are of the Adamic will be dealt with so that the new life, which is in Christ, will begin to manifest through me. Because the Bible said it's the first Adam, the Adam that comes first, the natural man will come first, then the spiritual. The spiritual man comes because the spiritual man is a man that stands from a one that has come to God, that God has decided to eradicate through the cross everything that had to do with the old so that the new will find expression. Let's look at this man finally and see some things that the Bible tells us about them. We have seen that they are still was. Give me first, give me first Timothy 1 verse 12. Paul writes about himself, and I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who has enabled me. Why? Because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Are you faithful? 
Are you faithful to what God has committed to you? Like I was saying, to the grace that God has given to you, to the Holy Spirit that he has deposited in you. Are you faithful? We read the parable of the talent that the man was cast out to outer darkness because he just took the talent, the one talent, and, and just dug it. And you do not see that the grace that God has given to you, you have dug, and you're just satisfied that you're born again, that if you die today, you go to heaven. Second Thessalonians. First Thessalonians, First Thessalonians 2, verse number 4. See another quality of those people. We have seen that these ones are servants and stewards of the mystery of God. We also saw where we read that these are men that are faithful because therefore God now enables them, putting them into the ministry. This one Paul writes again, but as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, even so we speak, not as pleasing men, but God who tests our heart as we have been approved by God. These are men that have been approved. And I tell you, before God will approve you, it means he has tested you. And so this man has been tested and they have been approved with. And now, therefore, God can entrust the gospel. Can God entrust you with anything? God would not do that if he has not approved you. So the men that establish the kingdom are men that in their life, God saw, God tested, God approved, and therefore God entrusted. And they never failed God. Friends, even as I wrap this up, in Ephesians 3, 1, 3 verse 1, Paul tells us about himself there. He said, for this reason, I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ for you Gentiles. Go to seven. For if indeed, of which I became a minister, how did Paul become a minister? According to the gift of grace of God given to me by the effective working of his power in me. Now, why I read this, I wanted you to see that Paul became a minister, but the reason why Paul could become a minister was first and foremost that Paul was a servant of the Almighty. He was a prisoner. That's what the Bible said. He was a prisoner. Who is a prisoner? A prisoner is a man, a woman that does not have any liberty of himself again. He's a man whose life is constricted. A man that cannot, I cannot just decide to do anything that I want to do. A man that is bound to God, for God to do whatever God wants to do. A man that cannot just decide to walk in his own frivolity, pursue his own desires, pursue his own ambitions. No, the men that God used of old, like Paul said, they were prisoners of the Lord. Men that are giving themselves over to the Lord and say, Father, here it is, it's your own, take it. If they are captains of industry, in that industry, men would know God has come. And that's why in this season we are looking at city elders. Who are these city elders? A city elder that's, that is not the prisoner of Christ, the man will go there and run his own agenda. There are men that are sold out to God that knows that in that mountain that God has, has put them, they will drive out the pigs and they will establish the kingdom of God in that place. Second Corinthians 2 verse 14. Now thanks be to God who always leads us in triumph in Christ and through us diffuses the fragrance of his knowledge in every place. These men are not men that shout. There are men that smell. The men whose life God smells sweet smelling aroma. Their life is a diffuser. Diffuses the fragrance of God. Anywhere God sees them or anywhere they are, their life diffuses the aroma. Friends, God has an aroma and that aroma can only be diffused through the lives of other men. These are the men that established the kingdom. And this is the kind of man, the kind of woman that God wants you and I to be. And I trust God 
that going forward, God will help you. It's just very simple. All you need to do is to come to God. That's what I do. Just come to God and say, Lord, I've seen my life. I don't need anybody to tell me. It's not pastor that will tell me I have seen my life. I know that my life is not meeting up. Lord, I come to you. Help me. Lord, change me. Tweak me. Anything that needs to give way in my life. Father, I cannot continue beyond this. Help me. That's the way I go to God every day. That's the way I lay my life before him and I cry to him. I ask him for help. Because I do not want to come to this earth and just pass and die like a mere man. Those that are in honor and they know not, they will die like the beast in the forest. Our Father, our God. Lord, you did not just save us, Lord God, for saving's sake. There is a plan in your heart. There is a desire in your heart. Lord, your desire is that your kingdom will come and that your will will be done on earth and is going to be done and established through us. And so, Lord, I pray for me and my brethren, Father, that, Lord, you will walk in us, O oh God, so that you can walk through us. Daddy, I pray that whatever hindrance that is in our lives, whatever blockade that is in our lives, Daddy, I pray, take them away, O oh God, that our lives, Lord Jehovah God, will be a vessel fit for the master's use, that we will establish the kingdom like the men of old, like you did, like Paul did, like the disciples did, like the early apostles did, that our life and true our life we will diffuse the fragrance of your knowledge everywhere we go in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.